consider the inherent paradox of the following idea. To experience something again for the first time. Sounds absurd, right? How is it possible that you can experience something again for the first time? There's only one first time. There's only one time when you can experience something with the hardly bearable ecstasy of direct energy exploding on our nerve endings, right? It's, it's, it's just not built into our constitution or our wiring. There's something called familiarity breeds boredom. There's something called hedonic adaptation. The point being, once you've had an experience, you can't have it again for the first time. You can have it again for the second time or the third time, but never again for the first time. And yet, the goal of all contemplative practices is a return to the deep now, a return to the present. Beyond the been there's and seen that's of the adult mind that inevitably cloud our capacity to ostensibly have a fresh experience, the astounding frontier of the present is constantly eluding us because we're trapped in a monkey mind of future anxiety and melancholy for the past. And that prevailing dread haunts the human animal like nothing else. Now I talk about this a lot because like all of you, we all secretly want to get back to the sides of ourselves that we were tapped into as children. We all want to be more creative. We all want to be more engaged with the people that we love. We all want to enter what Diane Ackerman calls states of deep play. We spend money to go to the movies to become completely immersed in a netter world, right? We want to go on the hero's journey and slay the dragon. We want our lives to be infused with meaning. We want to matter. We want to struggle. We want to climb the summit of the mountain. We want to have realizations, right? Epiphanies that crack us open a little bit. We want to bring that back to the villagers. We want to share that deep truth. We want a truth bomb, <laughs> right? And so it goes back again, contemplative practices, all these things, they're all trying to sell us a way to rid ourselves of our clunkiness, right? To rid ourselves of our lenses of perception, to transcend, to cleanse the doors of perception. Michael Pollan has a great line. He says, a sense of first sight, unencumbered by knowingness. And it's interesting because we love to learn, we love to grow, we love to know. Understanding is a kind of ecstasy, said Carl Sagan. And yet, even though understanding is a kind of ecstasy, understanding for the first time is what we really get off on. And so it points actually inherently to the importance of forgetting as an important variable in our happiness too. We gotta forget that we learned something so that we can learn it again, right? To have a sense of first sight, unencumbered by knowingness, that virginal noticing of the sensate world requires us to somewhat forget that we learned this before, that we've been there before, right? We're not just going to new places, but we're searching for ways to see the home world with new eyes. And they say this is enlightenment. They say this is illumination, right? When the doors of perception are cleansed, everything will be revealed to man as it is, infinite. Now I'm exhausted, both literally and figuratively, from trying to convey to you that I too share this angst and this hunger to enter these childlike states of awe and reverie. I think all the romantic poets were tortured souls with broken psyches who nonetheless longed to see the world in a grain of sand, to see heaven in a wildflower, to fucking hold the goddamn infinity in the palm of our hands and hold fucking goddamn eternity in an hour, right? There's a reason why we get goosebumps and hairs in the back of our neck stand up when we hear these guys talk about how the only people for me are the mad ones. Mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved. Aren't we all desirous of everything at the same time? Those who never yawn or say a commonplace thing that burn, burn, burn like yellow Roman fucking candles exploding like spiders across the sky. Why do we hang these quotes in our classroom walls? Why did my mom hang those quotes in her classroom walls? And I came as a student, somewhat anxious, somewhat curious, somewhat hungry for answers and better questions. And I see it written on the wall. <laughs> Minds are like parachutes. They only function when open. <sighs> the only thing standing in your way is you. <sighs> so I looked out the window of the classroom, like we all do, looking out the window of our metal coffins. <sighs> Walker Percy said that the search God, for truth. The search is what anyone would undertake 
if they were not sunk in the everydayness of their own lives, if they were not chained by the everydayness of their own lives. We've created these systems and we hold these systems in place, but then these systems hold us in place too. We've entrapped ourselves. And to even become aware of the search is to be on to something. Oh, the possibility of something more. And not to be on to something. Ah, here's the kicker. Not to be on to something is to be in despair, is to be slowly dying, is to be living a life of quiet desperation. <laughs> it's the reason why half of these authors that wrote half of these truth bombs end up killing themselves in the end, right? Because the alternative to this illumination, to this sense of first sight unencumbered by knowingness, to this platonic ideal, the alternative to that is unconsciousness, is the default setting, is the rat race, is the constant gnawing, soul-deadening sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. But <laughs> we don't surrender. We will prevail. We will continue to rage against the darkness, against our darkness. <laughs> I went to God just to see, and I was looking at me, she wrote. Maybe at the end of all our travels, we'll come back into ourselves to find what we were looking for. That's a reason to get out of bed in the morning.